Good morning, everyone. Today we are going to be uh, tackling a pretty sobering subject together uh, as, we, as we kick off this new series, and we're going to be, uh, especially on the heels of Gus's excellent sermon on death last week, we're going to be uh, taking a look at suicide uh, this week. And so because of the weight that comes with this topic, I would just kind of like to start before we jump in and be up front about uh, a few things as we get started. I think that with a topic like this that is as loaded and emotionally uh, charged, I think it would be easy on my part to be unintentionally, emotionally heavy. And so I'm going to make a guarantee on my part that I'm not going to, to dive into uh, the emotional side of it. I'm not going to be telling anyone's stories from up here or trying to intentionally uh, create a response. I think the subject itself uh, does enough of that work for us. I'm also going to be upfront about what this sermon is, is and isn't going to be because this subject is so broad that I don't want anyone to walk away thinking that I, I missed something. This is, I'm trying to be focused here. So what this sermon is not going to be is I'm not going to talk about uh, the relationship between mental health and suicide or statistics or how we should respond in specific situations or what happens to us after we die. Because again, Gus covered that excellently last week, and you can go listen to that um, sermon if you're wanting to know more about that last thing. Because I, I am not an expert or qualified to necessarily speak into those things, uh, but what, what, I, what we are going to be doing this morning is we're going to be look at a few things in regards to suicide. We're going to look at some of the preconceptions that we already have going into this conversation that I think impact what we believe. And then we're going to look at what God says about it and what he doesn't say about it. And ultimately what he wants us to do with that truth. We're going to look, and I'm try to answer this question this morning, is what does God have to say to us about suicide and where is he in the midst of this dark and terrible thing? And here's why I think it's important. I think it's important because we often don't talk about this subject because it's difficult, it's hard, and I think that these things need to be brought to, the, to light because suicide is an epidemic in our age. I think we can look at the world around us and see that. And we need to know what God says to us in order that we can walk in his light amid this darkness. Now, I think the first thing that we need to, to do is that we all need to recognize that we come into this conversation with some baggage, that we all have, a, have beliefs about suicide that we come into um, this conversation with. It's a vague topic. It defies definition a lot of times. In, in kind of asking some people that are wiser than me coming into this, it's like, how do we define this? I think something in common that I found was that it is hard to kind of pin down some things. And again, like I've said, it is an emotionally charged subject. But I think that we need to address first what we believe, because what we believe is going to inform what we believe about what God says, and that we need to have a place that we are starting from in order to know where we are going. And we need to, to learn to trust in God, but in order to do that, we have to know where we are starting from. And I think... In, in our culture or in our world, I think that there are some narratives and maybe some myths you could say that we believe about suicide and maybe we're upfront about that we believe these things or maybe they're more subtle beliefs that we hold that I think what we need to take a deeper look at uh, this morning. I think, and I think the first narrative that we believe that we need to take a look at is just this blanket statement of that suicide is selfish. And I think that we need to take a look at this because of how we use this belief. It does come from a, a looking at one's own circumstances and choosing to make a decision from that. But I think this blanket statement that I've heard used before that I think that we can think a lot of times is, is not necessarily a fits-all case. 
Some people choose to do this whenever they are faced with a crippling illness, whenever they are faced with dire circumstances that it's either I'm going to die this way or I'm going to die that way or having made a horrific decision and making a moment's instance. I think that oftentimes we use this idea of, of suicide as selfish in conversations. It's, it's a way for us to kind of distance ourselves from it. It's an argument that we use to, um, to try to convince people that, to not do that. And I think that trying to do that is good. But I think it's also a way that we can unintentionally vilify and judge those that have committed suicide or are contemplating it. And I think that we need to come into this conversation under the umbrella of what God says first and foremost. The second thing is, is the second narrative that I think that we tend to believe is that those who deal with depression and suicidal thoughts are always mentally, uh, mentally ill, have mental uh, illnesses, um, have mental health issues. And I think that it's important to address with this because I think it's easy to dismiss if we believe these things. And I think there is absolutely some connection between mental health and depression and suicide. I think science would back that up, but we can't make this a blanket statement for all people because ultimately we don't know. We can't be sure to know what people are experiencing. We can't be sure to know uh, or put everybody into a box because of that. And we can't just dismiss everyone as, as suffering on the inside in some in some way as an excuse to not take what they are experiencing seriously. And I think the third one, and this is one that we probably don't say out loud as much as that we wonder sometimes, is that anyone who commits suicide didn't have enough faith. And I think this, again, this is another way for us to, we have to try to wrap, we want to try to wrap our brains around certain things and understand them. And, and we might look at someone's life and think that they didn't have enough faith to, to carry on with whatever's going on. And it might be something that we, we think and we don't like that we think that or we say it out loud even. But I think that if we were to look at our own lives, if someone were to look at your life and take uh, not the trajectory of where your life was going, but to take just one of the outliers of, of a poor decision that you make or an instance where you chose to do the wrong thing, we would often, we're judging people based off of their one failure that they had, the one decision that they made. If we were to do that with all of us in this room, I think that we would all come up short. It's easy to notice others' failings, uh, but often not ourselves. In Romans 3.23, it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It's one of the most famous passages in Scripture. And I think that we have to look at our faith not as a, where did we end up, but what was our trajectory? Where were we going towards God? Our faith is about a trajectory and a pattern towards Jesus, not just based off of an outlier. And I think that the reason that we hold on to these narratives is because it makes it easy. Is this is a, it's a, a big topic. It is a hard topic, and we want to be able to, to, we like to fit things as people into boxes that we can understand. And I think that these narratives allow us to put this in a box, and we can put it in our mind and file it away, and whenever the topic comes up, we can pull out the box, we can use it. Um, and it allows us to dismiss the topic even. And here's why I believe that we do that, is that the reality is, is that we actually know very, very little about suicide. It leaves us with a million questions and often little to no answers. We don't know how to define what is or isn't suicide. Is somebody choosing to sacrifice themselves for somebody else suicide? Is somebody choosing, uh, choosing to jump out of a burning building suicide? Is it whoever decides to end their life for completely selfish reasons? Where does the morality play into it? When is it something that is right? When is it something that is wrong? And I think that scares us to have to think about that. We never know what someone is ultimately thinking or experiencing. And oftentimes we are, are surprised with what happens and taken off guard and left traumatized. And we never really know what was going on. And ultimately I think a reason that we like to put this in this box is that what God says about it is that the Bible is, is unusually silent regarding this topic. 
We have instances recorded in Scripture. We have, uh, such as King Saul at the end of 1 Samuel, he chooses to end his own life rather than being captured by the enemy when he's injured in battle. And we have Judas, one of the disciples of Jesus, chooses to end his own life after he betrays Jesus. But both of these instances are given descriptively, not prescriptively. There's nothing good or bad attached to it. It just tells us what happens. Now, there is one scripture that I do want to address that I think is often used in light of this. It's in 1 Corinthians 3, 16 through 17. And it says here, says, Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temples, God's will destroy him. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. Now, this passage is often believed to be a condemning or it, it is sometimes used to condemn those that have committed suicide uh, straight to hell. And that is a doctrine that, uh, that is held in some, in some, by some people. But I'd like to take a closer look at this passage. In, Rome, in 1 Corinthians 3, if we take a look at the whole chapter here, Paul is writing to the church in Corinth, and he is talking about divisions in the church. He is talking about the divisions between leaders within the church. And he uses this passage here as someone who is destroying the you here, the you are God's temple. Yes, it also talks in scripture that we individually hold the spirit of God within us. But here it's plural that Paul is talking about the church as a whole. Whoever destroys the church, God will destroy. And so this passage is not used in this way. And there really isn't another passage like it. And we are ultimately left uh, to leave that in God's hands. And we are left with very little to go off of about this. And so if the Bible is silent about it, I think that that makes us uncomfortable. But we need to, to, real, we need to find a different way of how we are to understand and believe this. And instead of fretting about it and being anxious about it or ignoring it, we need to let go of what we don't know and hold fast to what we do know. That God may not say something straightforward about it, but God has revealed a lot about himself that we can use to inform this conversation instead. And I think there's three things that we can know about God that I think can inform what we should believe about suicide. The first thing is that God is the giver of of life. At first John 1, 4 through 3, 1 verses, sorry, first John 1, 1 through 4. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He, as Jesus, was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. Without him, not anything that was made. In him was life, and that light, that life was the light of all men. And in Psalm, uh, Psalm 36, 9 as well, it says, For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we do see life. We see that God has given life to all of us. He has given life to the universe and all of creation with intentionality and purpose. God did not create anything on accident. Everything that he has created is, is intentional and it is with a purpose. And not only has he made life with a purpose, he has given us as humans, as people, he has given us the essence of his image. In Genesis 1, 26, then God said, let us make man in our image after our own likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heaven and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Whenever the Old Testament was written in that time, to carry the essence of something, I think that that, that that idea loses on us a little bit. But to carry the essence meant that you were carrying a part of that with you. That we're not God because he created us, obviously, but that we are carrying an aspect of God, that God intentionally put his essence on us whenever he created us, that we carry out the essence of God so there is an intentionality, there is an importance, and his work is accomplished in us through that. We also see that God values our short, small lives here on this earth, even though they're so, so small compared to the eternal nature of him. This is one of my favorite stories in scripture in Acts 16. 
uh, we see Paul again and his, his companion in spreading the gospel, Silas, are thrown in prison in Corinth after preaching. In the middle of the night, they're worshiping and they're praising together and the prison doors fly open and we see this happen. And when the jailer of, of the prison woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, do not harm yourself, for we are all here. This is a small instance of where God had everyone stay, even though all the prison doors had flung open in order to save this man and his life, but the lives of his family as well. God sees value in our lives, even though we are, are so small compared to him and there, our lives are short. All of our life is intentional. It has purpose. We are imprinted with God on our hearts. And all of our life has value in the eyes of God. And he wants to see you have eternal life in him. Your life and your eternal salvation are incredibly important to God. However, our lives in this world are fallen, and we as a result are fallen, and we experience pain and suffering. And the second thing that we can understand about what God has to say about that is that all aspects of our life, even our sufferings, are significant to God. We often see value in the good things in life, but when we have a, we have a very difficult time as people whenever it comes to seeing meaning in our own sufferings. We often see the value in other people's sufferings, but not our own. And I think about, like, survival movies. There was a movie that came out, I don't remember when it came out, it was 127 Hours, did anybody see that? Where this guy is hiking out in the desert by himself, and he gets wedged in between a rock and a cliff face, and he's out there for days, and he has to cut his arm off. I didn't watch it, because I don't think I could stomach that. But... But we watch this movie, and at the end, and he's on the other side of it. We're like, that guy overcame something, and that's powerful. You know, I think that that guy would probably, he could see the benefit in hindsight, but I don't think he saw the value in his suffering when he was going through it. And we can go watch it in a movie and see value in it, but when it comes to ourselves, we don't see the value in our own sufferings. Is that we want, and we see other people's uh, sufferings to have meaning, but we often want ours to be meaningless so that we can escape it and not have to deal with it. But God sees our sufferings differently. In James 1, 2 through 3, he says this, count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. You see, God knows something that we often ignore or forget is that he sees that our sufferings bring us to a greater understanding of him in our lives. That we think that the good parts of our lives are the things that, that bring us closer to God, but it is often through the darkness that we are able to walk through to the other side with God. We're able to see these things in hindsight, and we're able to see how far we've come, but we don't often see it while we are in the midst of it. You know, I think about Job in the Old Testament, the whole book of Job, that Job loses everything that he could possibly have, and God walks him through that to bring him to a greater understanding of it. I think about Joseph in the Old Testament, where he had, was betrayed at the hands of everybody else, his family, the people he worked for, even though he did nothing wrong, but God was working in the midst of that the entire time. Or about the disciples, that they had to deal with the fact that they had betrayed Jesus and left him and still had to, to work through that, and God brought them through to an understanding on the other side. I think the, the lie that we often believe is that, that the li our life in suffering is meaningless. But God not only sees the value in the, the quote-unquote meaningless and suffering, but God has a plan for where we are going. Our lives are truly in his hands. It's another famous passage of scripture in Ecclesiastes 1, 2, 3, 1 through 2. I'm mixing up my numbers today. I apologize. For everything, there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. And these plans and these times are all according to our sovereign Lord. And despite our best efforts sometimes to forget that he is the one in charge, God is still working in and around us. God gives us what we need, and it's often not the same thing as what we want. 
we don't get to be picky, but we can choose to trust him and entrust our lives that he will take care of us. We can either spend the rest of our lives anxiously avoiding um, that God is, is looking out for us and working in us, or we can join in with what God has planned for us. And wherever you might be walking in here today, uh, whether you're walking in darkness or you're coming alongside to walk in someone with darkness, that God has a plan for where you are going. And so in these three things, that God has created us intentionally, that he sees value in our sufferings, and he has a plan of where we are going, I would argue that this is a belief that God values our lives enough that he does not, does not want anyone to end their own lives because he sees the value and plans of where we can grow, we can go. He has a plan to bring you through sufferings to the other side, even in the deepest, darkest places that we find ourselves in. You see, God is with us in the struggle and the grief that comes with this, this terrible thing of depression and suicide. Now, here's the other thing, is that our knowledge doesn't mean anything. Just because we know these things doesn't mean anything if we don't let the Spirit lead us to action on top of it. We can know these things, but unless we are led to do something about this, um, that God wants us to do something about it. And so I want to just address a few groups of people in the room as we, as we come to, uh, to what we should do about it this morning. As, and the first group of people is for those of you in this room that have either attempted or seriously contemplated suicide. I would be ignorant to get up here and to think that that is not anyone in this room. I know that we often put a good face out for people um, and I think at some level we'd recognize that we all do have our own lives in our hands. But I want you to know this morning, if this is you, that God is greater than whatever you are experiencing. God is greater than whatever you are suffering through, even if it doesn't feel like it. And I'm sure it doesn't. But he sees you, he cares for you, and he knows where you are walking in. And know that his presence is often unfelt in our lives, but it is never wavering. His love for you is never wavering. And so my encouragement to you this morning is to not walk alone in it. Darkness and sin, they thrive whenever we are isolated, and the way to bring this to light is to be with God and to be with his people. God did not create you to walk alone in anything. He did not create you to walk alone in this. And this is an invitation to prayerfully walk with God in the midst of it. it it's a marathon. It's not a sprint to the end. It is a, a one step at a time, one second at a time walk. And be open and be with or find a community or friends. There are people in your life that are love you that want to walk through this with you. There are people in this room that would do that if you don't have anybody in your life. Do not let this darkness thrive in your life by being isolated, but bring it to light by being with God and being with his people. The second group of people that I want to address this morning is those of you that have had someone in your life that is close to you choose to end their own life. And I just want you to know that God sees your pain that God sees where you are at, he sees where you have come from, and he knows that your grief does not have an expiration date. There is, there is a start to it, but it's not a journey where we end up at the end of the mountain and that you're done with it and you can move on. Uh, but somebody wise gave me, uh, gave me an analogy this week that it, it's like losing a limb, that you don't do the same things, that life is different but that, that life is still a life that is worthwhile, that there is still worthwhile life to be had there. And to continue to walk alongside God in that, and that in walking, he will lead you in this new way of life. I also want to encourage those of you that are in this. Um, at the St. Charles campus on May 19th, they're going to be bringing in a guest pastor, Leroy Lawson. We tried to get him here. Obviously, that did not happen. Um, but he is going to be preaching on this topic, and he wrote an excellent book that I was able to, to get through a good chunk of as I was preparing for this about 
him coming to, to terms uh, with the grief of his own son committing suicide. And it is, it is a beautifully written and incredibly hard book to read, but I think that if you were in this camp, that there, is, that there are things that God can say to you through him, um, through this book, um, and, and through his message. So I would encourage you to listen to that, to any of you to listen to that message as well. And the last group is for those of you that are on the periphery. If you're not in either of these first two groups, then God has called you to be there for the people in these first two groups, to have forgiveness and grace and to treat it seriously. That we don't need to be dismissive whenever this topic comes up. We don't need to be afraid of this topic because we have a God that has revealed his truth and his light to us and that we need to see people as people and walk alongside them. Because how you talk about this topic, how you talk about it whenever you hear about it in the news, how you talk about it whenever you hear that some, of somebody who has, is important. Matthew 5, God, Jesus calls us, says that those who follow him are, are the salt of the earth and that they are the light, that they are the light of the world. That if you follow Jesus, that God has called you to preserve the goodness in this world, and that he has called you to illuminate these dark spaces in his name. And so I want to encourage you with how are you speaking light into those around you? How are you speaking light into these conversations? Are you seeking people out to walk alongside them in this darkness? Where can you do it more? Because God is present in you choosing to show up in these dark circumstances. Now, no matter where you are in this, this is an invitation to walk alongside God in these dark times and situations. The unseen and often unfelt presence of God is with us even there. Our faith in this is not based off of how much we know or how we feel at any given moment, what does or doesn't happen to us. It's not even sometimes about how much faith we have, but are we using that, that little bit of faith that we have to trust that God is taking care of us, that God wants you to do something with that faith? Because he is here in the midst of our dark and lost and hurting world, even when it doesn't feel like it. And he has invited you, he's invited me, and all of us to trust in him and to walk alongside him, whether you are struggling today, whether you are experiencing grief, or whether he has led, is calling you to, to share his love with those that are. The question is, will you walk with him in it? Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful for you that in this in this heavy subject and this dark topic, God, that you are still present, that you want us to bring these things to light so that we can bring your hope and your love to people that need it. So as we prepare, as we, as we leave from this, God, and as we let our minds and our hearts dwell on this more, would you stir us to action? Would you allow us to trust you more? Would you let your spirit fill our lives more that we can know that we can walk alongside you and that you are seeking to bring us to something new on the other side, that you are seeking to make us more like your son, that you are seeking to bring goodness and light into our lives. In the name of Jesus, it's in his name we pray, amen.